soar above with those who dare to look at the world from a new perspective and ask, what if? You're listening to The Altitude Podcast from Eagle View. Hi, I'm Piers Dormeyer, CEO of Eagle View Technologies. On this show, we bring you stories of pioneers who are redefining the boundaries of their fields. Today's guest is Marcus Widener, Chief Innovation Officer at Pannoni, a distinguished national engineering consulting firm. Uh, Pannoni creates smart, sustainable solutions that meet the evolving challenges facing our infrastructure and environment. So I'm thrilled to speak to Marcus about how all of Pannoni's exciting goals intersect with cutting edge tech and innovation. Thanks for uh, coming on board. Thanks for having me. Yeah, great. Um, well, talk to me about Pannoni. Uh, what do you, what do you, what does the company do? Um, yeah, what are you fo- focused on? Sure. Uh, so I'll break this into two parts. Uh, you know, so there's, there's the part of Pannoni that was founded in 1966. Uh, we, we consider ourselves a multidiscipline civil engineering consulting firm. So we're made up of designers, engineers, uh, scientists, inspectors. And really, you know, when you say multidiscipline, sometimes it means two or three things. We've got, uh, depending on how you break services down, you know, anywhere from 10 to 20 different services or subservice lines. And so we really run the gamut. And uh, I I think you'd best consider us full service. Uh, So all the way from, you know, the early stages of due diligence, uh, field data collection, feasibility studies, you know, which would include geo, enviro, all the all the, the sort of preliminary studies, all the way through design and then construction support. So we are not GCs. We don't do construction, but uh, we will we'll do some parts of construction uh, administration and management. Um, and for, you know, the duration of the, the company's history, I think we've, we've been viewed as a uh, you know, an engineering firm. Uh, but, you know, one of the things I was going to add on to that is, is since 2017, really since my um, arrival in this role, uh, we've tried to make a, th- a thoughtful pivot towards becoming a uh, little bit little bit more well-known as a, as a digital platforms company as well. So, of course, you know, we're not scrubbing the identity of uh, our engineering heritage, but instead we're layering on top of that, uh, you know, what we believe are thoughtful contemporary solutions, you know, that meet our clients' needs, uh, you know, with regard to asset management, um, you know, di- digital outreach and communications, visualization, things like that. So we built out some digital platforms. So I think that, you know, frankly, many of the firms in our space have done that. And uh, I, th- I think it's important that, you know, we at least remain competitive, if not, you know, look for opportunities to gain an edge in certain areas. And, and I think we have done that. Um, but there's there's a you know rapid socialization of what we do through through various networks LinkedIn especially so as soon as one of us in the industry does something everybody else notices it and then there's a lot of um, you know bandwagoning that occurs and so your your window of differentiation is pretty short you know at the outset so that's Pannoni in a nutshell a little bit old a little bit new and uh, you know I think our technology partners are part of that new side of the story for sure. Yeah, no, I, I was I was actually pretty fascinated. I was I was checking out some of the work that you guys do, and I was I was curious though. I did want to jump into that. Uh, how does a chief innovation officer role? Um, how, how does that that role develop in that context, and how how did that evolve, and what does it entail? I would say it. You know, my 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 role doesn't necessarily mean the company wasn't innovative before. <laughs> and I think, I think that's, that's probably a cautious, uh, you know, boundary I don't want to cross because, you know, we, we don't want to uh, say tarnish the past by, you know, by saying, well, we're doing things right now. Uh, I think we did things, you know, in the best interest of our clients for a long time. But what, what ultimately manifested in, you know, the creation of this role was, I'd say a number of factors. So you had a lot of uh, activity around the idea of smart cities in uh, we'll say the 2010s. And I think it culminated in Pannoni joining, you know, what was then called the Smart City Council. And right around 2017 is when uh, I was recruited in for the role. And, you know, there was a big push amongst many of our clients, especially in the infrastructure space, to start looking at emerging technologies, using proactive monitoring, using data analysis, um, 
really taking a more um, active approach versus passive and reactive. And so I think that you know became essentially the foundation for us as a firm saying we we need you know we need to start thinking about innovation and at the time the president of the company uh wanted to create a role that was focused on innovation and you know we called a chief innovation officer and that was really the genesis of of my role and then i would say similar to the way the company evolved over its history you know my role has evolved as well and and i think in a lot of ways, um, I hate talking about COVID and the pandemic, but at the same time, I think it it reframed uh, priorities, uh, not just for us as a company, but I think for many of our clients. It certainly changed the way that we view, you know, the workplace and commuting patterns and things like that. But I think it also, um, you know, in a sense, maybe it, it popped some of the balloons of the frothy smart cities discussions that were occurring. And then I think everybody said, wait a second, as we retrench and we figure out, you know, what, what are the necessities in the new economy? Um, you know, among them, there may still be, uh, you know, IoT solutions and what you might call smart solutions, but, but we're not going at it with the same kind of frothiness. And so I think what we're doing now is, I think, maybe a little bit more cautious, but at the same time, you know, we've got about seven years now of putting great digital solutions in clients' hands. And, and I think we've got a lot of demonstrated success. But but again, I think we come at it in a much more measured way. And not just us, I think our clients as well. And I think that, you know, this is like your classic hype curve where there's there's a, there's a frenzy, you know, see what happened with ChatGPT a year ago. And there's this huge, you know, almost logarithmic spike of adoption. And then it suddenly plateaus. And then it suddenly falls off a cliff because people realize, well, it's not going to do everything I thought it would. And so I think in a lot of ways, you know, things in the digital space, even in consumer tech, you know, they, they kind of flash and then they're gone. And then once you come up out of that, you know, that trough of disillusionment, you reach some sort of steady state where you say, you know what, here are the things that this technology is good for. And they're rational <laughs> and they and we derive value from them. And our clients or customers are actually getting something versus technology for the sake of technology. Yeah, you know, I I wanted to pick on that just a little bit. I think they would take my my tech bro uh, membership card away from me if I didn't mention Gen AI in, in, in at least uh, every conversation at least once. But, you know, you start talking about some of these emerging emerging technologies, obviously more accessible compute, and then obviously Gen AI. And now this this um, with rag with 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 rag um, as well that's making that even more usable. Mm -hmm. Where, how do you see how do you see that particular technology impacting what you guys do? Well, that's a great question. So right now, and, and, and frankly, prior to you know, we'll we'll say the hype of the LLMs and the chatbots, we were using tools that had machine learning. Mm -hmm. um, you know, object identification is a pretty classic use case. So we were using a platform, you know, to manage our pavement programs for some of our clients. Uh, this is going back more than five years at this point. And, uh, and I could describe a little bit about how that works. And then I think that's an analog for what a lot of data collection efforts will look like in the future, in my opinion. But basically, uh, they, they came up with uh, a data collection model that relied on an Android phone mounted to the dash of a car. You would drive a street network, collect video. I think, you know, at 7 FPS is, you know, typically was good enough. And then that video was fed into a machine learning engine that uh, would identify cracks and then grade them, right? And so once you've been able to, and then you'd, you'd chunk out your streets into 100 meter segments and then give each one a score. And then you could, you know, obviously aggregate that to a score for a road segment. And then, and then, you know, at, at that point, you'd have something that you could load in, side load into a GIS and use to become the basis of decision making and capital planning. And so to me, there's there are a couple, maybe three things that really converged quickly, you know, when we started to use that solution for clients. One is we were speeding the, the rate of data collection, right? You know, we were using something that was near instantaneous. You know, two, we were doing the work of humans, you know, which is that categorization or that, you know, the, 
the measure of quality of a surface, we're we're you know using RPA essentially, right? Robotic process automation to uh, you know collapse down and condense that effort into something that would take you know let's say a day instead of three or four weeks. You know the total round trip of of the driving of forty miles of network and then feeding it into a system. And then I think you know that the really clever thing is that you know it finally was giving geospatial systems, you know, a little bit more life, uh, you know, for, for many years, GIS systems at, you know, the state or municipal level were just kind of like pretty visual browsers of PDFs, you know, click on a point and, you know, get some attached information. And here you are actually able to interpret the data in the context of aerial photography or, or topographics or whatever. And then finally, um, we've been talking for decades about, you know, data-driven decisions or, you know, build, building out this decision support systems that are based on data. And, you know, of course, everybody's talking about data lakes, but you don't need a data lake to make great decisions. You can, you can have a data pond. And so driving a small network and coming up with a very usable set of data, I, th I think is, is great. And to me, that's kind of like, it, it's, it's akin to like building out, you know, uh, what do they call them, small modular reactors or microgrids, you know, you don't necessarily need to boil the ocean. And I think that's part of maybe the problem, you know, where we are still with AI is, is that people are thinking like, well, I'm going to bring in uh, open AI's technology and index all the information in my entire company. Yeah. And the question, the question you have to ask right away is, well, what's your objective? What are you trying to do? And if you, if you ring fence the, the outcomes, <laughs> you'll find that the amount of data that you need is, is, is pretty, pretty slim, right? It's a pretty small set of information. And frankly, with the way that there's so many third party sources of information, uh, you can rely, you know, on public domain information, you know, to a large extent. And so you're just covering the Delta, whatever is special about the circumstance or whatever happened since the last time you did your assessments. And then that's what you cover. So I'm answering this in the context of how does this, how does everything change with AI? Well, I think AI, to me, it's, it's, you know, lighter fluid on the fire. It accelerates what we should already be capable of. It shouldn't really be there to fight, you know, the proxy war, do the proxy engineering because it's not qualified to do so. It's not licensed or insured. Uh, so, you know, you look at it as an augmentative uh, capability or technology. And I just attended a lecture last week um, at UPenn and, uh, there was a fellow who wrote a book called Co-Intelligence. I thought, what a great term, because that's really what it is. You're cohabitating with something that has maybe not sentience, but, you know, some level of intellect, and you're able to leverage that and then amplify and accelerate your own um, efforts. So, you know, in, in general, where do we go with it? I think, um, you know, that's one of hundreds of platforms and technologies out there that are learning how to thoughtfully bring AI into their product. You know, and, and it's funny, a year ago, everybody was they're sort of tapping the table like, OK, Autodesk, when are you going to come out with, you know, Autodesk Copilot and it's going to do all my CAD drawings? Of course, that's not going to happen. <laughs> and we don't want it to. Otherwise, you know, you're, you're forcing an entire industry of professionals into obsolescence. But what is going to happen is you're going to have you know, something like Microsoft Copilot for just about every major platform out there. Adobe's come up with content creation, AI, uh, and then you have, you know, the whole milieu of, of third parties like Mid Journey and Sora and others where you can generate content. Uh, but again, it needs tweaking and it needs incredible prompt engineering in order to not get something that looks like it's artificial intelligence. <laughs> no, I totally agree. We're, we're going through that right now. Um, in fact, Obviously, using using things like Git, GitHub Copilot to um, augment your your developers so that they can you know, the the rote coding, for example, perfect for reducing some of the, some of those headaches. But it really is. I love that idea of co intelligence because that's really exactly what it is. I got to attend a great lecture by uh, the founder of Anthropic, oh, and one of the nice. yeah one of the uh, insights that I I just didn't I guess think about was. The quantum leap to go to call it Chat GPT five um, is 
an order of magnitude more cost in training and compute in order to reduce those hallucinations and those errors to a level that you could get to true automation of something like customer service. So it's, I think we're a long way, and I think that the goal shouldn't be complete automation. I think it should mm-hmm. just be being really smarter, more efficient um, kind of assist. But it's a fascinating space. Going in a little different direction, what are, what are some projects that you're particularly excited about you're working on? Not particularly um, exciting projects, but I, I would say, you know, we continue to build on uh, the experience we've gained over the last five, six years in building out, you know, platforms and tools for our clients for asset management. So that that really uh, is, to me, um, it's, it's, really, it's really an extension of, you know, the design and construction phase. So you're taking as-built information or existing digital twin information and then moving it into a context where it can be useful during operations, you know, maintenance and operations and an ongoing, um, I guess, usefulness of, of the platform. And, you know, we just saw a catastrophe uh, on a massive scale with a, the key bridge uh, collapse in Baltimore. And, um, you know, if that, if that were a bridge that, you know, had just been built, I mean, first off, set aside any of the, you know, the, considerations around whether there should have been prevention measures, but rebuilding it, you know, today, if it's a modern design, would be a matter of uh, regenerating, you know, all of the, you know, schematics and material schedules and detailing documentation. Um, and I think in, in, in a way where that whole fabrication process could be accelerated, I think if it's a hundred year old structure, uh, they're working with likely mylars and and you know really old films and things so they're, they're gonna have to first take all of that and digitize it and that's you know if they decide to rebuild it exactly the way it was and so i think the promise of asset management is you get this really intensely accurate digital record of what exists and so when it comes time you know to replace a connection or you know strengthen a span because um you know they're seeing heavier vehicles than they intended um, the documentation exists. And so, you know, I think that's, and that was the piece that I, I don't think anybody did before digital tools existed. You know, you provide your clients a roll of drawings and it would go in a flat file somewhere and that became the asset management system. And, you know, preventative maintenance or, or any sort of project would have been done, you know, primarily in paper. So I think that one of the things I'm excited about right now is we have an opportunity to help clients, you know, at a pace that's comfortable for them, move into a more electronic way of working. You know, some of the other things that I, I, I mean, my my personal background is more of the GIS space. So I think spatial data, spatial data systems, GIS are really near and dear to me. And some of the things coming out of Esri, especially, you know, announced at the recent summit uh, are really exciting, you know. Uh, we're looking at ways of using this feature called data pipelines where, you know, you can essentially, I mean, it, it does exactly what you think. It's kind of a connection to, you know, other data sources, um, you know, which I, I, you know, I think in a sense we're, we're doing that already. And, and to some extent, that's how we leverage um, Eagle View imagery and some of our mapping applications as well. But I think Esri is just doing a phenomenal job at pushing the envelope of the capabilities of platforms some of the other things that that I know they're advancing quickly are, you know, their their capabilities around 3D world building. Um, you know that that has been a, a constantly evolving space, but we're seeing more and more clients want to represent, you know, the potential design in context, and that means, you know, if we're doing a roundabout, for example, they'd like to see that in, in three dimensional context, and you know, think Google Earth, right, and you know, geospatial systems seemed like a natural fit, but up until, you know, when I say recently, I, I mean the last few years, really GIS was like the domain of 2D data. And then as soon as you wanted to get into 3D stuff, you were using 3DS Max or bringing it into Unreal Engine. And what I think is interesting is these worlds are all colliding. And now suddenly it's going to be really hard to tell the difference between an Esri built 3D world and an Unreal Engine built 3D world. And, you know, if somebody's listening, I'm sure they're going to say, well, that's, that's not true. But I think from the perspective of a client, uh, something that's, you know, very tactile and immersive 
is what they're looking for. And frankly, they're not going to care what, what brand platform it was developed on. And the last thing I'll mention is, it's just like everybody, um, Esri has something called GeoAI, which I, I think is really interesting, you know, and it's essentially like, you know, briefly loading up a model with, you know, intellectual information um, about, you know, properties of so metadata of the geospatial system, and then, you know, creating an environment where you, where you can ask questions of the data. And I think that's, that's ultimately what, you know, we, we want, right? That's the power. So, you know, people load big PDFs into Claude and ask questions of the document. Well, this will sort of be like that. I'm going to load a large data set and I'm going to say, well, how many, how many parcels are, you know, greater than one acre in size? And can you do that today? Of course, but you have to be somewhat skilled. You have to be able to write a little query. Uh, and I think we're moving to a space where, you know, we can render queries in plain language and GeoAI is just one of many similar types of tools that I think we're going to see uh, quickly emerge in the space. And again, it's not taking the place of all the hard work that goes into m creating that parcel map layer, you know, doing the QCQA of ensuring that the boundaries are correct with the survey team. All that hard work still has to occur. And there are portions of it that can be automated, but it still has to happen and you still require, you know, human attendants and shepherds over the, you know, the, the fleet of <laughs> the flock of drones in the sky. But uh, I think what's going to happen is we're, we're going to democratize access to the data through these these conversational platforms in a way that we never imagined was possible before. So those are some of the things I'm excited about. And I think, you know, those are emerging technologies. We haven't put them in front of clients yet, but I, I can see some real applicability, excuse me, with uh, with all of them. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And I think just that high quality, I mean, you get a nice plug on aerial imagery, but that high quality data set that underpins the stack is, is really, really critical. And when you start talking about the visualization in 3D and that resurgence, I think we're starting to see that's powered a lot by some of these tech like neural radiance fields, NERF, and all the work that's going into that is, is spectacular. So um, very exciting. Um, so I want to be, be respectful of your time uh, and give you the last word. Anything you'd like folks to know about Pannoni or what you're doing? Uh, I, I mean, I'll, I'll be honest. I, I think you gave me a really great platform here to share all the, all the cool yeah. stuff we've done already. Yeah. Um, you know, we're, we're uh, 1,500 people continu continuing to grow and I think doing great work in the United States and, and, and even abroad. Some of our projects take us around the world. Uh, but... Not, nothing beyond just that, you know, we, we have a, a hunger for emerging technology, uh, but I think that we balance that with, you know, the notion that technology has to be adopted in a thoughtful and, you know, we'll say value producing way. And, and I think earlier in the conversation, we talked a little bit about, you know, the effects of, you know, the pandemic and the reckoning it, it forced um, in a lot of ways. And I think that we, we've come out of it certainly uh, stronger and you know, with more more awareness of of what's important, uh, and I think that's important because that's why we call ourselves consulting engineers. You know, we we work as advocates for our clients. You know, to ensure that they're servicing their you know their constituents, their residents, and their customers in the best possible way. And I hope we get to uh, continue to do that. Yeah, no, I you said it you said it very well. So, Marcus, thanks again for the time. Enjoyed it. It was my pleasure. That's all for this episode of the Altitude Podcast from Eagle View. Again, I want to extend a huge thank you to Marcus Widener for enlightening us about the world of information, technology, and innovation. And thank you for tuning in. If you're enjoying the show, don't forget to subscribe, give us a follow, and tell your friends to listen in. I'm Piers Dormeyer. See you next time on the Altitude Podcast. <laughs>